When the two previous speakers this afternoon have been Steve Lawson and Al Mohler, and the next one is Sinclair Ferguson, you feel a bit like a piece of lettuce and a meat sandwich. <laughs> but hopefully some of you here like salad. Very grateful for the invitation to speak here this evening, count it a great privilege to be among you these days and to try and share something of the book that I recently wrote, Jesus on Every Page. I've sort of taken informal surveys wherever I've gone on Christians' Bible reading habits, and if they're at all accurate, I think the Old Testament probably forms about 10% of most Christians' Bible reading. Take away Psalms and Proverbs, we're probably down to about 5%. And a lot of people will hear these statistics and say, well, so what? What's the big deal? Well, I'd like this evening to try and stop you shrugging, so what? And try and persuade you that this Older Testament is well worth reading. I want to do it in two ways. First of all, I want to wear my teacher's hat. I want to give you 15 reasons why we should read the Old Testament. And then I want to put on my poet's hat, or maybe I should call it a beret or something like that. I want to give you a little poem that I wrote that if the teacher will move the head, I hope this might move the heart a little bit. And together, the result will be more reading of the Old Testament, especially more Christ-centered reading of the Old Testament. First reason you should read the Old Testament is because it reveals Jesus. If I told you that I found 39 bonus Gospels, 39 hidden Gospels that not only prepared the church and the world for Jesus' coming, but was actually full of Jesus Christ, you would, you would leap, wouldn't you? at the the opportunities we read them. And that's what we have in the Old Testament. It's not just full of preparation and predictions, it's full of Jesus Himself. He is in the Old Testament revealing Himself and His salvation to needy sinners, using prophecies and predictions and pictures and poems and stories, and maybe above all, through His personal presence as the angel of the Lord. The Old Testament reveals Jesus. Second reason, the Old Testament helps us understand the New Testament. It is virtually impossible, I would argue as an Old Testament professor, it is virtually impossible to understand the New Testament without the Old Testament. Um, When we're reading the New Testament and we come across a word or an idea that we don't understand, the first place we should turn is not the dictionary or even a Greek lexicon. It's the Old Testament. The New Testament assumes an underlying knowledge of the Old Testament. It was written largely, the New Testament was written largely by Jews and for Jews. We cannot really fully understand the New Testament without knowing the Old Testament. Third reason, The Old Testament saves sinners. The Old Testament, yes. When Paul said to Timothy that the Holy Scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus, he was talking about the Old Testament, not the New. It hadn't been written yet. Paul's basically saying, just like the New Testament will save sinners through faith in Christ Jesus, so the Old Testament does in like manner. It not only did save, it still does save as Christ is preached from the Old Testament. Fourth reason, the Old Testament is a manual for Christian living. And don't we need that today? All of us, when we're saved, we want to know, how do we live in a way that keeps my relationship with God holy, happy, and healthy? The Bible makes clear that God's given us moral principles to live by that will help us keep that relationship with Him in a good state. 
in the Old Testament, especially at Mount Sinai, God summarized these moral principles. And admittedly, there's a bit of work involved in separating the moral principle from the cultural setting and application. There's a bit of work involved in separating the moral law from the ceremonial and the civil law, but it's not as hard as people make out. And if there's anything our culture needs in the midst of this fog of moral relativism, it's clear moral principles to drive away the confusion. The church needs it as well as the world, and that's what we have in the Old Testament. Fifth reason, the Old Testament presents doctrine in story form. Story form. God's not only given us laws, He's given us lives. He's enfleshed His doctrines and His laws in real flesh and blood humanity. When we go to the Old Testament, we find Abraham as an example of justifying faith. Job's an example of perseverance through God's preservation. Elijah's an example of effectual fervent prayer. Ruth and Naomi are examples of communion of the saints. Where wherever we turn, we find the moral principles and the New Testament doctrines really played out in technicolor, Dolby, high definition, flesh and blood humanity. And although there are many people that really connect with doctrine and system and logic, there are many people who connect much better with story. And so we have here in the Old Testament a wonderful way to connect with people using story, stories that present the same truths, but in a very vivid and memorable way. Sixth reason, the Old Testament comforts and encourages us. When we read it, we experience what the Apostle Paul spoke of in Romans 15, 4, the comfort and encouragement of the Scriptures. Don't we need that today? Who doesn't feel the need for just a boost, for an encouragement, for, for a model to follow? And when we look at the Old Testament, that's what we have. We have the Old Testament comforting and encouraging us when we see God's relationship with Israel, His faithfulness, His commitment to His sinful, erring people, His sovereign mercy, His loving grace. When we read of the hall of faithers in Hebrews 11, we so much better appreciate them when we know their Old Testament background. That's what really encourages us and comforts us in our own day. When we sing the Psalms, we're connecting with the comfort and encouragement that has comforted and encouraged generations through the millennia. The Old Testament comforts and encourages us. Seventhly, the Old Testament was Jesus' Bible. When a president is interviewed, say President Obama is interviewed, he's sometimes asked, what books have really impacted you? And people ask that because well, they want to know what went into making this person what he is, and maybe they also want to have a wee bit of that for themselves. Well, if I could get that book, maybe I'll be president or something like that. That's what we have when we think of Jesus. What was, what was the most influential book in his life? It was the Old Testament. What was it that made him the man he was? What was it that influenced his vocabulary, his character? His, his life, His teaching. It was the Old Testament. That was what He learned from His mother in that godly Jewish home. That's what He memorized. That's what He studied. That's what He sang. That's what He eventually taught and applied and lived out. The Old Testament was Jesus' Bible. Eighthly, the Old Testament displays Jesus' trophies, His trophies of grace, you know, in some ways, at least in my opinion, the Old Testament saints are more amazing than the New Testament saints. When you think of how little Bible they had, how few in number they were, how small the church was, how little light they had, and yet what faith they had, 
persevering and looking forward to a coming Messiah through so many discouragements in the midst of so much darkness. It's, it's just incredible, isn't it? These trophies of grace in the Old Testament display the almighty work of Christ in the soul. They, they shine with a special luster in Jesus' trophy cabinet. They display, the Old Testament displays Jesus' trophies. Ninthly, the Old Testament shows us the, the bigger picture of redemption. When we, when we see that God's plan of redemption began long before Calvary, long before Bethlehem, when we see every event being meticulously planned, forecast, planned, and played out, when we see that nothing happened by accident and everything is happening according to that perfect plan, does that not give you a much bigger view of redemption and a much bigger view of the God of redemption? Of course it does. The Old Testament shows us the bigger picture of a bigger God and a bigger redemption. Tensely, the Old Testament strengthens our apologetics. There's various estimates about how many prophecies there are in the Old Testament, maybe a, a bare minimum of three to four hundred. Thirty to fifty of them are incredibly specific and particular. And the apostles and Jesus used these prophecies and their fulfillment as a mighty weapon in their evangelism, in their apologetic in the public square. They realized that having such prophecies being fulfilled so perfectly, so meticulously, so particularly, were a huge asset in convincing people about that Jesus Christ is Lord. And today, sadly, the church has forgotten how to use the Old Testament in an apologetic way. It's as if we're, we're fighting a war with one hand tied behind our backs. So, we want to read the Old Testament to strengthen our apologetic. Eleventh, we want to read the Old Testament because it explains our culture. It explains our culture. Imagine if you, if you walked into a play halfway through, maybe at the halftime interval, and you sat down and you started watching the remaining couple of acts. Well, you'd be scratching your head wondering, what's going on here? Maybe sometimes you'd think, oh, I've got it, and then something else happens and you realize, no, I don't, I don't have it. It's, it's really almost impossible, isn't it, to figure out a play without knowing what happened in Act 1 and 2. And sadly, many people come to the Bible and they start at the halftime interval, and they expect to make sense of the Bible and make sense of our culture with that Bible. We really need to go back to the beginning, to Act 1, creation, Act 2, fall, Act 3, redemption, beginning in Genesis 3, and of course being fulfilled in Matthew 1 and following, and then Act 4, consummation. But we'll never be able to understand our world, our culture, what's happening all around us, our relation to this world, without knowing the whole drama of salvation. The Old Testament helps to explain our culture. But the Old Testament, twelfthly, also gives us hope for our culture. Don't we desperately need hope for our culture? When we look around us, we just see so much degradation. We think, is there any hope? Well, yes, there is. You look back in the Old Testament, you see some really dark and delinquent times, don't you? You think of Noah and his day. You think of the Tower of Babel. You think of Sodom and Gomorrah. Think of the times of the judges. Think of Israel in Egypt, Israel in Babylon, most of the times of the kings. There were desperately dark times as sin and its consequences were played out in our world. 
And yet, God kept raising up deliverers and leaders to rescue His church, to renew and reform His church, and even to recreate His church and His world. And in our day, when we seem to be in an accelerating downward spiral, and we're seeing Old Testament times being repeated in our time, then we go to the Old Testament to rekindle hope that the darkest dawn could be just a few minutes before the brightest noonday. The Old Testament explains our culture. Thirteen, the Old Testament makes sense of our story. We all have a story. We are all continually telling ourselves a story. We have a narrative about ourselves and our place in the world and our relationship to God and others in it. But we cannot make sense of our story. We cannot understand our story apart from God's story. And when we read the Old Testament, we have so much of God's story there that we must bring our stories towards and have God's story confront our stories, maybe condemn our stories, maybe rewrite our stories, write a happier ending to our stories. The the fact is that unless we bring our story into God's story, our story is not going to have a happy ending. But when we put God's story at the center of our story and seek a connection with His story at every point in our lives, then we can truly have a happily ever after at the end of our days. Fourteenth, the Old Testament warms our hearts. Remember the two men, the road to Emmaus? Did not our hearts burn within us as He talked with us on the way and as He opened the Scriptures to us? That need not be a 33 AD experience. It can be a 2014 experience. And many of you have experienced it, haven't you? As you've read the Old Testament and Christ has come out of the pages into your life and it's given you that most blessed of heartburns, spiritual heartburn that you never want to end. The fifteenth and last, the Old Testament makes us appreciate the New Testament even more. Yes, the Old Testament reveals Jesus, but there's also concealment. There's also shadow. There's also limitation. There, there's a sense when we're reading it that there's a there's a frustration in it. There's, there's, a, there's a longing and a desire kindled that's not met. But when we open the pages of the New Testament and we find the incarnate Christ there, don't we appreciate Him all the more when we've had these desires and longings kindled, even these frustrations stimulated by our reading of the Old Testament? We surely do. We appreciate the New Testament even more. But let me just take off my teacher's hat, put logic, reason, system aside for a moment, okay? And let me put on my beret, try and imagine me, I don't know, smoking a cigar or something like that on the river Seine. This is tough for me. It doesn't come easy to a Scotsman, believe me. (laughs) But if I've tried to move your minds, I want to now try and, I want to try and move your hearts. What do we find when we open this book? Let's open the covers and take a quick look. Wherever we turn, wherever we read, a familiar name is what we meet. It's Jesus on every page. He wasn't idle and quiet for thousands of years, just watching and waiting till His turn drew near. He was busy 
and active in grace and in power. His mercy was growing in seed, bud, and flower. He is the Word by whom all things were made, the promised seed to defeat the serpent's raid. The covenanter come to save his people. Abram saw his day. Jacob saw him as an angel. With the blood of a lamb, he painted his salvation. With an outstretched arm, he defeated the Egyptian. Redemption, relationship, rules in that order, dwelling with sinners in the center, not just the border. He skillfully taught using visual theology. Levitical priests offered sacrifice daily. No blood, no remission, no forgiveness of sins, but need more than sheep, for conscience has pain. The Father chastised His people's rebellion. The years numbered forty in the wilderness of sin. He still sent His Son, though, to be their faithful leader, a glory cloud by day, at night a fiery pillar. Moses chose Christ's reproaches and spoke of Him often, but His sinful bad temper barred Him from Canaan. His last written work, Deuteronomy to author, He spoke of the prophet, one like Him, but better. Jesus on every page. Yeshua chose Joshua to conquer the land. He united the tribes in one mighty band. Much good was accomplished. Israel was blessed. But Jesus gives better land, victory, and rest. Jesus, the angel, stopped Israel's extinction. He saved and saved through Barak, Samson, and Gideon. Still, every man did what in his eyes was right. Believers scanned the horizon. No good king in sight. Where's Jesus on any page? Hope dawns in four chapters of godly romance. God sends a Redeemer His kingdom to advance. God says of a Gentile, Ruth, you shall be mine. A Moabite? Yes, in the Messianic line. Hannah predicts God's anointed Messiah. King David arises. Is this our desire? He is the man after God's own heart. Eternal King and kingdom now start. But David, Solomon, and every successor sinned and fell short in serious measure. Israel divided then distant exile. Faith in Messiah faces Babylon trial. Where's Jesus on any page? But God is still faithful. He keeps covenant, raises heathen King Cyrus, Israel to replant. Nehemiah and Ezra rebuild with great joy. The kingdom is coming, the devil to destroy. But the devil's still busy. Haman wants all Jews dead. Messiah's line and purpose now hang by a thread. Esther ventures in faith. Her fate no one knows, but it's her time, not Haman's. He's on the gallows. Job's innocent sufferings, no fault of his, He's sure precious gold is the end of all this. Not only a picture of the Redeemer to come, the Redeemer comes early and shows Job his home. We sing the Psalms to him as God only wise. We sing the Psalms of him with faith as our eyes. We sing the Psalms with Him. He sang them below in times of rejoicing and in great sorrow. Jesus on every page. From worship leader to wisdom teacher, a greater than Solomon's there and here, 
Although, Madam Folly may lure us to whoredom, in Jesus are hidden all knowledge and wisdom. The best life without Him is vanity of vanities. The worst life with Him is verity of verities. Education, possession, cash, joys, toys, and friends, but what shall they profit if no Christ at the end? I am the bridegroom seeking a bride, a people to marry and love, to nourish and cherish right at my side. I can't wait to come down from above. I'm wonderful, counselor, prince of peace, butchered for sinners in atoning sacrifice. The Spirit's upon me. Good news for the meek to set free the captives and strengthen the weak, Jesus, on every page. Jeremiah predicts, I'll make covenant new, a covenant effectual. It's something I'll do. I'll be your prophet, your priest, and your king. In grace, I'll forgive and forget all your sin. I call to the wicked, turn, why will you die? I'm the good shepherd who calls you to fly. I'm the new temple, God's glory to share. Jehovah Shema, the God who is there. In Daniel, two sides are warring. The furious conflict is hot and hostile. In lion's den, furnace and prophecies, the victory is mine not devils or men's. Some of the prophets are quite a bit smaller. Their message is often quite grim. But even there, jewels of Jesus are shining. They still speak clearly of Him. In Hosea, He lures the unfaithful. He pours out His Spirit in Daniel. Obadiah says he'll conquer the malign. He even uses useless Jonah as a sign. In Amos, he roars like a lion. In Micah, he pardons all our sins. In Habakkuk, he gives hope in the famine. In Zephaniah, he sees us and sings. Nations' glories flow to him in Haggai. Zechariah opens his fountain for sin. In Malachi, John the Baptist gets a mention. Then 400 years of silence begin. Where's Jesus on any page? Four centuries, no Jesus, no page, dark, dismal, depressing the age. Then, angel choirs erupt in the skies, Jesus born with real human eyes. No more just predictions and pictures, no quick visits in mere human form. He's come to be with us and be like us, unleashing a devilish storm. The promised seed, bruised but not broken. Four Gospels record His great win. No more pages dripping blood red. Conqueror's gold is His color instead. Jesus on every page.